Hi everyone and welcome to April 2022 Wildlife Wednesday Monthly Roundup. I'm your host Tenley Thompson and we've got some amazing video to show you from all over the greater Yellowstone ecosystem this month. Let's go ahead and get started with a look at the winter wolf breeding season with some footage taken by our guides Sarah and Tyler and some narration from guide Tyler. Winter in Yellowstone. Full of wonder and mystery, truly one of the most magical of places. This winter, we spent the majority of our winter wolf multi-day in Yellowstone National Park. And my, was it an adventure. During our trip, we saw several different wolf packs and a variety of really interesting behaviors and interactions, including the eight mile pack, making a kill and then playing and socializing together. However, one of our favorite encounters was watching the courting behavior of the Wapiti Lake pack. During this encounter, we watched the usual mating behavior of the alpha pair. This includes the alpha female averting her tail, inviting the male to mate with her. However, during the sighting, the most interesting behavior was not actually the alpha pair, but it was the beta female trying to entice a, a dispersal male into courting her. During this encounter, she actually crossed the road several times and left her pack in order to approach the strange male. After scanning the landscape for him, the pair unite and then disappear behind a hill together. One thing that's interesting about wolves in Yellowstone National Park is that oftentimes these packs will have multiple females breed. The alpha pair will obviously have pups, but then sometimes several females, beta females, will also produce litters of pups. And that's because the prey base in Yellowstone is very high in compared to other places in the world. It's also beneficial for these females to produce pups within their natal pack because the landscape in Yellowstone is very competitive for wolves and the chance of them surviving and creating their own pack out here is very, very low. Talking to and teaching people about these really unique natural interactions wolves have with their environment and with each other is one of the reasons why I love being a guide. And seeing, you know, this encounter between this beta wapiti female and this dispersal male is one of the reasons why winter wolf multi-days is one of the best times of year and one of the best ways to come and see wolves in Yellowstone. Thanks, Tyler and Sarah. It's always a delight to get a chance to see the wolf breeding season during our winter multi-day programming. But next, let's go back into Grand Teton National Park and the National Elk Refuge. Did you know that you can go surfing in April in these parks? Let's tune in with Bo to find out more. Hey everybody, Bo here, coming to you from Grand Teton National Park. And more specifically, the Grovant River Bottom. So here's the Grovant River behind me, starting to fill up for the springtime as all of our snow melts. Wanted to come down to this spot because it's an interesting location, uh, specifically to talk about our elk migration and uh, how the elk do this unique thing that uh, ecologists have dubbed surfing the green wave. So to give you a little perspective of where we are, currently I'm standing in National Park land or the Department of the Interior. On the other side of that river, over there, is uh, the National Elk Refuge. So if you've been on tour with us, or if you've visited Jackson Hole uh, in the winter time, uh, pretty hard to miss all those thousands of animals, those elk that live close to town. 
Now what's happening right now is those elk are getting ready to catch the wave, to start surfing the green wave, which we'll talk about a little bit more. And when they do that, they leave this refuge property, cross this Grovant River, and then get onto National Park property. Uh, some of these animals will, will push all the way north into northern Grand Teton, National Forest property, and some all the way up into Yellowstone. Now it's an interesting, uh, an interesting thing that happens, but these elk have to move because they're following their food. And even though you can see behind me, it's, it's snowing right now, which you would think, gosh, maybe those animals want to stay south. Uh, in fact, they want to push north right now because it is the spring, it is April, um, but they're, they're pushing north to go get better food. So uh, stay tuned on this little section. We're going to talk about uh, this idea of surfing the green wave in the springtime in our environment here and uh, show you some really cool footage of our elk uh, moving through the landscape. Surfing the green wave is a theory, a hypothesis that states that these herbivores, which are including elk, moose, mule deer, they like to stay what's on called the leading edge. And what they mean by that is these elk keep track of where their forage, their food, has the highest nutrient quality. So we do the same thing at our grocery stores where we choose, you know, baby asparagus, baby arugula, baby romaine lettuce. All the versions of those plants have the highest nutrient qu quality when they are young. The elk are doing the same thing with the forage that they are finding on the natural landscape. So ecologists have dubbed this surfing the green wave because these animals are in fact staying on the edge of where the spring and the warmer temperatures have allowed their forage to start to green up. Now what's interesting is that the elk will also keep track of if they've pushed too far north, if they're kind of past the leaning edge so that that quality of food is actually not quite high enough because spring and the warmer temperatures have not reached those areas. It's really fascinating to watch these animals move through the landscape and keep track of this. Sometimes we'll see them at a location like this footage is being shown, kind of at the cen center part of Grand Teton National Park. If you see them get too far north, they'll come back a little bit, uh, retrace their steps, get to that higher food quality, and then wait for the new grasses to continue pushing further north. Rather remarkable to watch. Surfing the green wave, the elk are the masters. Well, there you have it, folks. You can go surfing in a snowstorm in the spring in Wyoming. Uh, you just have to be an elk surfing the green wave. It's pretty cool to watch these animals move through this ecosystem by the thousands, watching them every day as they push further and further north. It really does feel like when we're on tour this time of year that you are in Africa, uh, right on the Serengeti. I can say that because I actually did used to live in Africa and it feels very similar to that. Thanks so much for watching and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Bo, for a great look on how you can surf Wyoming. One of several ways, actually. The other way, of course, being with a surfboard on the Snake River on some of our recirculating rapids. But we do wish the elk good luck on their journey as they make their way northward. They will be doing so all month. It's a great month for watching wildlife in the two parks. But as you can see, the weather is definitely variable and it's definitely spring here. Speaking of spring, one of my favorite spring animals to watch are river otters. So let's check in with Laura for the latest from those guys. Oh, hey guys, this is Laura. I'm joining you today to highlight some of our great sightings in the parks this month. Full disclosure, us guides have our favorite wild animals or our favorite sightings. You know, in all honesty, we go out every single day looking for the best possible wildlife for our guests. But hey, 
sometimes there's a gem or something really exciting or really interesting that happens to us while we're out there. <laughs> For me, one of my favorite animals to see are the North American river otter. <laughs> they seem to pop up into our lives spontaneously. It's not like I would be able to predict a great otter sighting, at least most of the time. But I might check near water, near the river, or near lake where otters are most frequently found. That is their, their home, their habitat. <laughs> cool, let's showcase some video. In this first one, a family of otters has found shelter underneath a bridge. Otters will often den in cavities next to a river bank, often dug by other mammals such as beaver. Beavers excavate area to have a lodge or have a den for themselves, but otters will reuse those sites. The second video is one of my favorites from this winter season by guide Sarah and Tyler. A family of otters is testing a beaver, which is the large mammal in the center of the frame. If you watch closely, you actually see the, the otters pulling the beaver's tail, which I thought was absolutely adorable. But in reality, they may be testing the beaver to see if it's weak, see if it's possible prey for them for today or maybe the future. Beavers lose a lot of weight over the winter. Their tail goes from nice and fat in the fall, but through the winter, they'll use their fat reserves, meaning by spring, it's nice and skinny. <laughs> Otters, unlike other mammals, do not hibernate in the winter. So they have to deal with snowy or icy conditions in the colder months. So to hunt or to travel over ice and snow, they have to learn to slide, which might be a good way to learn how to hunt as a group or a family. Oh, this fourth one's pretty interesting. It's a stare down between an otter and a coyote. They're both predators, so maybe they're just sizing each other up. They call it a draw. I don't think it's worth it for either one of these predators to try to, to spring on the other. The icy conditions are very cold over the winter, so otters have a very thick fur coat. Per square centimeter on their bodies, they might have up to 60,000 hairs. So very, very warm, waterproof coat covered in oil. We often see otters as a group or family cleaning one another, working to tend to the other's coat so that they can stay dry and warm even in these, these very cold conditions. Well, thank you for checking out my favorite wildlife sightings. It's been a pleasure to be a part of this. I'll see you next time. Bye. Oops! I just realized I was on mute, you guys. I'm sorry. You know that I'm prone to doing that. I was just saying that we've had river otters on almost every tour this winter, just about in the last couple months. Not entirely sure why that is. We definitely had a little bit of a lower snowfall than usual. That might have something to do with it. We usually see a lot of river otters in the winter, but this was a particularly unusual year for them and really a delight to see. So pretty awesome stuff there. Thanks so much to Bo, Laura, Sarah, and Tyler for their contributions to our videos this month. It is time for my second favorite part of the program, which is of course our trivia. Now after our trivia section, I will be answering your questions live. So if you've never been joined us on our Wildlife Wednesday program before, welcome. Do ask your questions in the comment section our guide Kelsey is moderating there tonight, so make sure you say hi to Kelsey, and I will be answering them after the trivia question. Now, before we get into how to ch get your chance to win this month's trivia, um, let's talk about last month's trivia answer, right? We should answer the, the question from last month. Um, feel free to comment in the comment section 
if you think you know the answer to last month's trivia, but we've already given out the prize for last month, you'll have to go ahead and answer in the comment section for this month's trivia for your chance to win. So first and foremost, we had um, a really big celebration uh, recently. And of course that is, the question was, how old is Yellowstone National Park? Uh, and of course, 25, 50, 150, or 200 years old, I will tell you that there was a very large birthday uh, for Yellowstone National Park pretty darn recently. So go ahead and if you know the answer to that one, go ahead and put it in the comment section. The part two to this question, of course, uh, which is a little bit more complicated, is what day is Yellowstone National Park's birthday? On what day did Congress set aside land for the world's first national park? Now, I gave it away a little bit. I said it was recent. Now, the answer, of course, to this was that uh, Yellowstone National Park's birthday was just back on March 1st, which is A. And then, of course, if you want to do the math to get the question, the answer to the second part of the question, Yellowstone National Park was set aside by Congress as the world's first national park in 1872, which means it just celebrated its 150th birthday. So happy birthday, Yellowstone National Park. Certainly one of my very, very favorite places on the planet. And I do encourage everyone from all over the world to visit Yellowstone at least once. You certainly won't regret it. So pretty cool. Did you get the answer right? Did you guys get the trivia from last month correct? Congratulations to our winner from last month. Um, but yeah, let's get to the fun stuff. Let's do this month's trivia question. Now, Tyler couldn't be with us this evening. He is traveling, but he did want to give you guys, um, a slightly easier question, a slightly more difficult question. I asked him as our quiz master, usually he joins me here on Wildlife Wednesday to really try and stump you all. Um, so first we'll start with the easier and then we'll go with the second one. All you have to do to win uh, is you have to just answer in the comment section and we will choose amongst those correct answers at random for a chance to win a gift card to our EcoTour Adventures store. We started the EcoTour Adventures store during the pandemic as a way to help pay for guide and employee benefits. Um, if you'd like to contribute to the guides you saw in this broadcast today, feel free to check it out. Kelsey will go ahead and post um, a link, but our sponsored item this month is our EcoTour Adventure hats. If you'd like to have one of these for your very own, there's pretty cool. There's three different designs. We have the bear, the moose, and the bison designs. They're pretty, pretty fun to wear. We like wearing them all summer. Um, feel free to check that out. Kelsey will get us a link in the comment section. Um, but there's plenty more to check out in our Eco Tour Adventure store, so definitely see that. And of course, if you just enjoyed the broadcast and you don't need a hat or anything, but you want to give a donation to the benefits uh, for the guides who contributed to this night's broadcast, feel free to check that out as well. Okay, enough of all the shopping options. Are you guys ready for the trivia question? Question number one. Name a current member of the cat family found in Grand Teton National Park. One, American Cheetah. Two, Bobcat. Three, Bengal Tiger. Four, Serval. Or five, Snow Leopard. Which one of these is a current member of the cat family found in Grand Teton National Park? If you know the answer, go ahead and tell us in the comment section for your chance to win that gift card and maybe get one of those hats for yourself. Um, there is only one correct answer this month. I, we heard from you guys that you didn't like the all of the above quite as much. So we're trying to make that a little bit easier. Okay, hopefully everybody got a chance to sort of look at all those choices and make up their mind. Now we do have a slightly harder question for our folks like Don and other folks who are hopefully joining us tonight to try to stump some of you wildlife pros. If you want a second entry into our trivia question to go ahead and get two entries into for that gift card versus just the one, see if you can answer this one correctly. Approximately how many mountain lions live in Yellowstone National Park? A, none. There are no mountain lions in Yellowstone National Park. B, 900 to 1,000. C, 5 to 12. D, 34 to 42. Or E, 81 to 96. 
If you think you know the answer of how many mountain lions live in Yellowstone National Park, go ahead and let us know in the comment section. Now I will tell everybody, of course, that if you are watching this from a group page or it's been shared to a friend's page, you do have to go on the original Eco Tour Adventures page to comment in our comment section, both so I can see your comments for the Ask a Naturalist se segment, but also for your chance to win. And that's just because we can't always access all the pages where this is shared. So we're only gonna be able to count correct answers off of our page, which we know we definitely can check out. All right, I hope everybody got a chance to see both of those and is gonna get a chance to answer correctly. For those of you guys who are not tuning in live, not to worry, we will not go ahead and take a look and pick an answer for the next five days to give plenty of people time to go ahead and get their answers into the comments section and get as many people a chance to win as possible. Now, I do want everybody to know we are not going to have a Wildlife Wednesday next month, so there will be no Wildlife Wednesday the first Wednesday of May at 5.30. We're not gonna do it because we're all gonna be in Yellowstone guide training. So Kelsey was in the comment section and I will be joining all of our fellow guides having a grand old time up in Yellowstone National Park teaching each other all the amazing things we know about the park so that we can all be better guides in the future. So we'll miss you all, but we will be back in June. So I hope everybody enjoys their spring and we'll have extra, extra footage and probably twice as much content for June when we're back. All right, now it's time for my very favorite part of Wildlife Wednesday, which is I'm here to answer your questions live, you guys. So if you have a question about the natural world, um, the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, about critters in general, uh, any question from any age group, uh, five to 100 is certainly welcome or even younger than five. Um, I'm here to answer them live. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at my iPad that's sitting here and it's got your questions um, as they're coming up live. So when you see me looking down, that's what I'm looking at and I'll answer them in the order in which they're received. Sound good everybody? Okay, let me go back a little bit. Let's see here. All right, GM says, or Jean, sorry, Jean says, is it true that pronghorn are not found in Hayden Valley? So the Hayden Valley of the Yellowstone, um, located in Yellowstone National Park, is where the Yellowstone River flows, uh, basically actually out of Yellowstone Lake and to the north. It's one of the only northward flowing lakes in the world. Uh, the question, of course, is pronghorn antelope. Do you see them there? And the answer is no, almost never. Um, I have never seen a pronghorn antelope there before, and there's a very simple reason for that. There's plenty of other places in Yellowstone National Park that you can see pronghorn antelope. Um, the Lamar Valley is particularly a good spot dependent on snow levels, but the Hayden Valley is surrounded by heavy lodgepole pine forest and some pretty darn mountainous, inaccessible terrain to get there, pronghorn are a migratory species. And so for instance, our Grand Teton National Pro Park pronghorn follow the path of the pronghorn into Southern Wyoming every year, and then migrate back up into Northern Wyoming, one of the longest migrations in the lower 48, and actually one of the largest migrations in the world that they're taking by a hoofed mammal. It is too hard for pronghorn to travel up into the Hayden Valley, too many mountains to cross and too much heavy forest. They are an animal over the open plains. If you can think of, uh, you know, where the deer and the antelope play, right? Those pronghorn antelope crossed all over the Great Plains uh, along with bison. Those are animals that do much, much better in open, open conditions. Now bison, they're tough cookies and they can migrate through just about any kind of conditions. So we do see, of course, lots of bison in the Hayden Valley. In fact, there's probably more bison in the Hayden Valley than anywhere else in Yellowstone National Park, but we don't see those pronghorn. You'd have to go north to see them into the places like the Lamar, uh, or you'd have to go south into Grand Teton National Park where we have a really wonderful, viable population. So thanks very much for that question. That was a good one. Now I think Bobby wins as for the person watching today from the furthest away, but I'm not exactly sure uh, what flag that is? Is that Ghana? I need somebody who's good with flags. This is not a strength of mine to tell me what flag that that represents. Bobby, I know that's not one that's nearby, but go ahead and let me know in the comment section because I'm feeling a little silly that I'm not quite sure 
which flag that is. I'm a little embarrassed, but hopefully somebody can help me out. Let's see here. All right. I'm looking through all the comments. Thank you for everybody who let me know I was on mute. I can't believe I did it again. I'll learn one of these days, guys. Ah, great question. Libby asks, did any of you get to see the Wolverine? No, we didn't get to see the Wolverine. So we have um, a record board in, in our office that we all use to brag about our wildlife sightings to each other. And we actually have a record for the first guide on Eco Tour Adventures staff to ever see a Wolverine. Um, and the name of the record, because you got to have a good name, right, is to, to, to get a Hugh Jackman. And no one has ever accomplished a Hugh Jackman, which means they have never taken out a Wolverine. Now, we do end up taking out a fair number of celebrities every year. So I guess there's always a chance that you could win the Hugh Jackman by taking out Hugh, Hugh Jackman. Um, but no, the way I think you'd get that record... Um, as so the one who's the arbiter of the record board, I can say this, but you have to get a Wolverine. Uh, that particular program was the first official wildlife tour to ever have a Wolverine spotted. There was an unfortunate situation a number of years ago where a guy had actually claimed they found a Wolverine uh, working for a different company and they were lying about it, which is totally crazy. It was very controversial and the guy got fired and it was, it was really too bad. So this was really, really cool to see that we actually had this really awesome, successful Wolverine sight sighting. Um, the thing about Wolverines is there are almost none between Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park. Um, it always, it just shocks people to know that we probably have less, um, well, the, the casual estimates, the, the conservative estimates are less than 100 Wolverines in the continental United States, but a lot of biologists think definitely less than 50 Wolverines in the entirety of the United States. Um, there was a program that was done by the Northern Rockies Conservation Cooperative a couple of years ago where they were trying to figure out how many wolverines lived in Grand Teton and Yellowstone. After, I think, three or four years of trapping, they only captured two or three of them in total, which is strongly suggestive that we've probably only got somewhere between five to maybe eight wolverines between the two national parks. And these are very widely traveled animals. So if you can picture that the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem is more than 10 million acres of land, um, Yellowstone, you know, itself is more than 2 million acres and you've only got less than 10 wolverines moving around on a landscape that's bigger than some states. You can imagine that finding one's a little bit like a needle in a haystack. And in fact, that's exactly what happened with this great sighting. Maybe Kelsey will link to it for us online that just happened in the last month where this awesome wildlife guide had one crossing a road and had an opportunity to see one in the northern part of Yellowstone National Park. So we were all really, really excited to see it. It's definitely a lifelong dream of mine to see a wolverine. Uh, to even see wolverine tracks would be really, really exciting. Uh, but you definitely would want to have to get into the high country to get a chance to see those. There's a wolverine who we did briefly have a radio receiver on. And he, in the matter of just a couple of weeks, went right over the top of the Tetons uh, from uh, Wyoming into Idaho with no difficulty in the dead of winter. There was another wolverine that was tracked that walked all the way from Utah all the way up to Grand Teton National Park. They are very widely traveled animals uh, and very little is known about them. So really, really a special thing to see for sure. So great question. Let's see here. Caitlin, this is great. Do you have professional photographers there who work for the park who took that picture that's hanging behind you? Caitlin, there are, of course, many professional photographers who like to visit and travel to Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park. But we have several professional photographers on our staff who help teach our photography programs. Um, I, it's a little silly for me to say this, but of course, I'm filming this um, from my house. So, of course, the person who took the photograph behind me was, well, me. Um, that picture was taken via a helicopter uh, of Grand Prismatic Spring. And I will tell you that if you do want to support, guide, um, you know, health insurance and benefits and all these sorts of things, um, we do that have that, that we do have that image for sale on our web store. So if you want to do that, uh, I, I'm glad to help be a good supporter of my fellow teammates. There's a lot of really cool photography, definitely worth checking out. Um, all of the footage we take on Wildlife Wednesday, unless it's shown otherwise, like we'll put a little thing on the bottom there, is taken by our guides while they're on tour. Um, every once in a while, a friend of Eco Tour Adventures will get some really great footage and we'll go ahead and we'll share that, for instance. 
Um, but we'll go ahead and we'll put, you know, it'll be white text on the bottom of the video. It doesn't happen too often, but every, every single one in a while, there's something really that's too good to pass up. Or if something's really rare, like for instance, we're trying to talk about Wolverines. Well, needless to say, we don't have any Wolverine footage. So we might have to borrow uh, footage from folks with permission. Um, but yeah, for the most part, all the photographs you're seeing, all the video, that's just guides that are, they're, they're, they're taking stuff on, on programs and on trips. Pretty cool stuff to see for sure. Great question. Lois asks, any grizzly sightings yet? Yeah, Lois, yes, we've had quite a few grizzly sightings. Um, you know, we had a mild winter. This is normally the time of year when we expect to see grizzlies first start to come out. Uh, so not unexpected. Primarily large male grizzlies at the moment. They're the first to emerge from the den, followed by males and females that are a little bit more middle-sized, followed by females that were pregnant and now have cubs. Um, same thing happens with black bears just about a month later. You get the biggest black bears emerge first, followed by males and females without cubs, followed by females with cubs. So, you know, for those of you asking about bears like 399 and some of our other famous sort of celebrity bears, we would not expect to see her until very late April or early May, typically. But for those of you guys who follow this broadcast regularly, you know that 399 never does what I think is typical. Every single time I think, um... I understand any animal or any species and I get cocky about it. They humble me really quick by doing something completely to the opposite of what they do. But if I was to use good evidence as a guide and gosh, I've been following 399 now for over 15 years, she has never appeared before late April. So that would be a first if she was to suddenly show up earlier than that. But we definitely have some male bears around, including a bear who has been seen to breed with 399 multiple times. Um, you know, we don't know who 399's cubs' fathers are without doing genetic studies, but it seems awfully likely that this particular large grizzly is probably the father of several of her cubs, including perhaps some of the quadruplets she has now, and also very famous grizzly bear 610, who we hope will see emerge in late April as well. So great question there. Let's see here. Mark's got an interesting one. He says, I'm hearing more talk, debate about the growing population or visitor issues with Grand Teton National Park and Yellowstone areas from pages I've joined. What's the latest on this evolving problem? Mark, you're right. We are having record visitation every year for about the last five years and in Yellowstone for about the last 10. More and more people are discovering and exploring all of our national parks. Grand Teton and Yellowstone are certainly not unique in this, but many of the great Western classic parks are seeing particularly high levels of visitation. So places like the Grand Canyon, Glacier National Park, Yosemite, they're all facing the struggles of more and more people trying to visit our national parks. Now, one of the great things about the national park system is our national parks belong to everyone. They belong to me, they belong to you, they're held in trust for all the people of the United States for the benefit and the enjoyment of the people is from the original founding act. It is, however, a new and novel problem. We've never had the level of visitation that we currently enjoy um, even back in the 1950s, which historically was peak numbers for visiting, visiting the national parks, get the family in the car, drive across the interstate and go see something special. Lots and lots of different pilot programs, initiatives, studies are underway by the National Park Service and partner institutions and nonprofits to try to find common sense solutions to some of the problems we're facing, like a lack of campgrounds, increased traffic, so on and so forth. Um, but I think sometimes the problem gets a little overblown, to be perfectly honest with you. Are there more people in the park than historically there used to be? Well, yeah, there are. Is that going to keep you from having a good experience? No, I'm in the parks every single day, you guys. I get to go up there year round and spend my time. And I'm here to tell you that Yellowstone National Park and Grand Teton are so big that there are places for everybody to feel like they've gotten back in the backcountry and get a chance to really enjoy the quiet, the silence, and the wildlife of these parks. Um, definitely there's some things that, you know, are causing impact, particularly in really heavily visited places, um, places like Old Faithful and, and then the like, you know, they're definitely getting loved. Uh, but the park is working really, really hard to find ways to manage those things so that our children and our children's children are going to have the same opportunities we do today. So, um, I think we had a situation a couple of months ago, I want to say almost a year ago now, where there was a, 
um, a commentator on the Today Show who said, don't go to the national parks this summer. They're too busy and you're not going to be able to see anything. And people were calling us up in a panic and going, well, should I not plan to come? And uh, we just had to laugh. We said, no, 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 no. When we say that visitation is increasing, it is increasing at a steady rate year over year. But it's not like it's going to be like going to Disney World. You're going to have a good opportunity to see the national parks in their natural state, to get away from people. Having a good guide, I have to say it, is key. But there's no reason to not come and see us uh, and to do it in a way that is responsible. Now, if you want to learn more about ethical wildlife viewing and responsible ways to enjoy the national park, there's a couple really great resources out there. I'm gonna put Kelsey to the test again. Jackson Wildlife Foundation has a wonderful new website all about how to do that in, the, in a good way. And of course, Visit Jackson Hole has some great tips on recreating responsibly in our area. Definitely worth checking out for sure. So great question there. Don, this is a great question. We see dead ungulates around the park, but never bears. Do they die mostly in their dens during the winter? Really, really good question. Uh, we do see dead bears in the park, but there are far, far more ungulates, hoofed mammals, than there are bears. So if we think about it, um, you know, we've got, depending on how you want to argue it, somewhere around maybe 1,500 bears in the Great Yellowstone ecosystem. Some, some studies will say that number's a little higher. Some studies will say that number's a little lower. Um, you know, we don't have a good recent study on black bears, but significantly more of those. Compare that to the tens of thousands of elk and deer um, and the thousands of elk that are in the park. I'm uh, sorry, pronghorn that are in at least Grand Teton National Park. And you can see probably what's happening, which is to say, if something's going to get hit by a car or you're going to see a dead animal, you're probably going to see one that's coming from the tens of thousands species versus the one that's coming from the hundreds or thousands species. So we do see dead bears. We do see, you know, that have been hit by cars, for instance. We do see dead wolves that have been hit by cars, just not in the same quantity as we see some of these other animals, simply because there's more of them. As for bears dying in the den, well, one of the primary mechanisms of mortality um, across the Great Yellowstone ecosystem is winter. A lot of animals do die from winter. Animals who are out in the elements during winter, yes, you're going to come upon um, those carcasses of those animals far more likely. So a really good example is the reason all the grizzly bears, the male grizzly bears are coming out right now is because they're feeding on the winter kill of deer and elk who didn't survive the winter. Um, and that's a great protein source until that green wave makes it to the valley floor. Um, but of course, if you run out of body fat and resources as a hibernating animal, uh, what can happen is your heart just, you know, your breath comes less and less as there's less, less energy to work with and your heart rate goes down and down as you have less energy to work with. So something like a, you went to ground squirrel or a marmot. Yes, absolutely. They would die in hibernation if they didn't have enough body fat. They would just go deeper and deeper into unconsciousness and not wake up. Not a terrible way to go, if you ask me. A bear, though, bears are not true hibernators. Uh, if you want to know about that, Kelsey maybe can link her latest blog post that she wrote all about this. Um, but if a grizzly bear runs out of body fat, they actually wake up and start foraging. So you're not going to see that same situation where bears are dying in the den like other hibernating mammals are because they're not truly hibernating. Uh, they're doing something called torpor, which is where their hibernation is more like a very a slightly deeper sleep than they'd normally have, right? So a, a ground squirrel is going to have a heart rate that's just a couple beats per minute, uh, and their breathing is just going to be a couple breaths per minute. A bear is going to be just slightly lower than a deep sleep. So a very, very different situation, not a true hibernation. Good question. Let's see here. Let's see here. Oh, Libby, great question. Did I see the Northern Lights? Yes, Libby, I did. They were spectacular. I live here in the town of Jackson and the National Elk Refuge is a block and a half from my house. So that was the darkest place I could think of to go. So I went out into the National Elk Refuge in the dark of night, uh, keeping in mind that there were a lot of migratory animals around. So staying pretty close to my car. And I was actually able to get some really spectacular photographs of the Northern Lights. 
um, as well as see them. It really was a cool opportunity. Um, if you'd like an opportunity to see the Northern Lights, no matter what latitude you live in, it can be possible. We are just a couple years away from the solar maximum. The sun works in uh, solar cycles. So every tw 20 years we peak and then uh, we go into a, you know, a drought about 10 years later and then we peak about 10 years after that. 2025 is going to be our solar maximum peak, which means northern lights are going to become more and more and more common until 2025. And then, I'm sorry guys, we've got a buzzing phone here. Let me turn that off. I apologize. There we go. Huh, we've been doing these broadcasts for over, gosh, we started them in March 2020. So this would be our two year anniversary and we've never had the phone go off in the middle of the broadcast. I didn't even know that was possible. Uh, but I apologize for that delay. Okay, so solar maximums. We have the sun max, you know, the, the uh, solar storms and coronal mass ejections coming from the sun as a maximum every 20 years. And 2025 is going to be that peak. So we're going to have more and more opportunities for northern lights as we make our way to 2025. And then still great opportunities, but fading after 2025. Uh, my favorite website for that is spaceweatherlive.com. What you're going to look for is the KP level. That's the solar storm level, the amount of solar radiation that might hit Earth. Um, and there's some great maps out there that show when northern lights are going to be visible in your area. But the short version is anywhere between KP5 and KP6. Most of Canada will have an opportunity to see northern lights. KP7, um, the latitudes around Wyoming, sort of that sort of area will have an opportunity uh, KP 8 and 9, the vast majority of the United States outside of the very southern tip of Texas or Florida will have an opportunity. And then, of course, a KP 10 would have northern lights all the way in Florida. But we wouldn't want a KP 10 because that's when it seriously starts to mess around with things like the electrical grid in the International Space Station and satellites and things. So KP 10s are very, very rare uh, for good reason. And so we don't see the northern lights in Florida too often. But what you want to do is you want to look to the north for a, a light sky, oftentimes green tinged, although this latest round of Northern Lights was red tinged, which was really fascinating to me for sure. So pretty awesome guys, thanks very much for that question. Let's see here. Don, great question. I've noticed about three homes on the Northern base of Blacktail Butte. How are they able to build there in the park? Don, those are in holdings. Um, so Grand Teton National Park was set aside for the benefit and the enjoyment of the people based on land that was purchased by John D. Rockefeller Jr. Um, so, okay, the mountains and the lakes at their bases of Grand Teton National Park were set aside as Jacksonville National Monument in 1929. And then John D. Rockefeller bought up the vast majority of the valley floor and then gave that land to create Grand Teton National Park um, in 1949. The thing is that... Some people refused to sell, you know, it was their family's homestead and it didn't matter what price Rockefeller was going to offer, um, he wasn't going to sell. In the beginning, when Rockefeller started buying this land, he was using it with land companies that didn't appear to, uh, appear to be affiliated with him, like the Snake River Land Company. So a lot of people didn't actually know it was the wealthiest American who ever lived who was buying up their land. They thought it was just a land company. Um, but as they got closer and closer, of course, to Grand Teton National Park's creation, uh, people began to figure out what was going on. Now, the three homes that are at the base of Blacktail Butte are all in holdings. Those families have the right to live on that land for a certain period of time. What happened is when Grand Teton National Park became a park, they all negotiated basically lease settlements with the National Park Service. Um, some very, very famous bear biologists, the Craighead Brothers, are located at the base of Blacktail Butte, which is to say they're um, their children and grandchildren are currently there. Um, they have a hundred year lease on the land. That means that they only are going to be allowed to be there for a hundred years. And in 2050, we'll go ahead and have to vacate that property. Um, Barker Ewing, so Patty Ewing and her husband have an inholding there. Um, sadly, Patty's husband has passed, but if you know, um, I think it's Dave Barker, you know, Barker Ewing Whitewater, um, that's where they're originally based from. I believe hers is a hundred year lease too. Don't quote me on that, but I think I'm correct. And then there are actually two more homes there that I think are also hundred year leases. Um, so they won't be there forever. They'll be there till about 2050. Uh, some people like the Craigheads have said that that was the agreement that their parents and grandparents made and they plan to vacate 
and um, not be there in 2050 and they're not going to fight the park. Other people have said that they plan to fight tooth and nail uh, and fight against the agreements that were made uh, to have the right to stay there. Now, there's different kinds of inholders in Grand Teton National Park. Some people have the right to stay what's called a lifetime lease. They can live there uh, for the rest of their lives. But after that, that becomes parkland. Some are these 100-year leases we just discussed. And some of them are family leases. They and their direct descendants have the right to live there um, forever, as long as they have direct descendants. There's a few that are even a little bit more unusual. The Dornan family, for instance, which runs Dornans, has the right to operate a business in the national park. And even something like the Jacksonville Airport is actually an inholding inside Grand Teton National Park that has the right to operate as a business. So lots and lots of different ways that this was all done. What the Park Service will occasionally do is they'll offer some of these folks what are called land swaps. Um, if you drive up the Moose Wilson Road from Teton Village, you'll see there's a bunch of houses right at the entrance station to Grand Teton National Park. Those are folks who traded land in the interior of Grand Teton that was very important to the park for land right on the edge of the park. Um, most of that land, of course, is quite, quite valuable. Lots of millionaires and billionaires living there right on the side of the ski hill. So that whole northern side of the Jacksonville Mountain Resort, where all those houses are now, are all land swaps. The Park Service actually owned right up to the boundary of what is now the ski resort and swapped that land for land in the interior so they could have continuous wilderness uh, in return for having folks sort of move their properties to the southern end of the park. Lots and lots to talk about on that topic, but there's the bare minimum for you. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, but the, the Craighead family, of course, that live there at the base of Blacktail Butte, incredibly important in the history of biology, inventors of the radio collar, the bear-proof trash can, great conservationists, the Ewing family, same goes for them. Um, so good folks that are living there who definitely homesteaded that land and have the right to be there at least till 2050. Great question. Let's see here. All right, I think... I think I got everybody's questions. Thank you guys so much for joining me. It sure is a pleasure every month to spend this time with you all. I hope you all have a fantastic April. We won't see you once again in May, but we'll be back in June for that first Wednesday of June at 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time for another Wildlife Wednesday Weekly Roundup. Until then, so long. Have a great spring, everyone. Bye-bye.